Welcome, listeners, to www.ironradio.org, the website and podcast for all things strength sports and sports nutrition. With your hosts, Lonnie Lowry. Remember, Phil is like a gnarled old oak tree held together with scar tissue and bone spurs. Rob Fortney. And I'm telling you, the pain that I would suffer was ex- beyond excruciating. And Phil Stevens. Do it, Rob. You'll kill all those nerves. Thanks for listening. Welcome, Iron Radio listeners. This is Lonnie Lowry. I'm an exercise physiologist, and I'm a nutritionist, and I'm a former competitive bodybuilder. And this is Phil Stevens. I run Strength Guild, I'm a competitive powerlifter, an all-around nice guy. <laughs> this is Dr. Mike T. Nelson. I'm owner of Extreme Human Performance, faculty member at the Kerrig Institute, and creator of the Flex Diet Cert, and I'm actually at the International Society of Clinical Neuroscience meeting here in Florida on day three. Wow. So winding down yeah. there by day three? Yeah, yeah not too bad. Um, obviously, we're recording early, so just step, stepping out of one of the talks here, and then today is just kind of a half day. Um, but yeah, super fascinating stuff. Um, everything from what type of exercise helps your brain to how eye movements uh, relate and what to possibly do instead of just give people medication for uh, mental illness and, yeah, all sorts of wide range of topics. You know, interestingly, I just had a guy in the gym approach me yesterday and said, you're the science guy, right? And I kind of laughed. <laughs> and he's, he was asking me about specific exercise training uh, for ALS, right? Oh, um, interesting. For Lou Gehrig's, yeah. And so I said, listen, I'm not an expert in that. Here's what I know, but let me – let me print off some things for you. And, you know, that's what it's always handy to be able to reach for like um, sort of an undergrad level, like pathophys textbook or clinical exphys mm-hmm. textbook. And because if I print, him, print stuff off from Medline, he's just going to be like, what the hell is this? You know, uh, yeah. um, potentially not. I mean, obviously, a lot, a lot of our listeners have no problem going to National Library of Medicine. But anyway, just maybe think about the whole neurology connection, you know. Yeah, yeah, definitely. Um, okay, we have three pieces of mail that we're going to handle today, everybody, and then we're going to we're going to go to the topic and just sort of it's just sort of um, subjective how we feel about things kind of uh, topic. It's it's about heroes. We've had le- uh, episodes about mentors and heroes before. What I wanted to do is take a different spin on it and talk about. Our philosophies, our training, our eating philosophies, and how they were influenced specifically by certain heroes. So we'll do a little round table. We'll name a hero and one of the things we picked up from them. Uh, listeners, you probably realize you're not a carbon copy of any one person, like Phil would often say. Uh, you're an amalgam, right, of some of the, what you favored the most from multiple uh, exemplars. And so that's kind of what we're going to talk about after the break, is lessons from heroes. Okay. Um, Males. This first one is from Francisco. He got an email uh, from Brad Pylon. And I am not familiar with him, uh, but Mike, you are. But uh, everyone, yeah, yeah, bear with me just a second, and then we're we're going to ask Mike about some of his uh, qualifications. Um basically said, is this true or is it guru stuff? Should I count protein calories? That's what Francisco is asking. And it's a good question. Um, Essentially, this email, and it looks more like a um, marketing blast to me, um, is basically saying protein is free food. You don't count the calories. They don't matter. uh, That sort of thing. So Francisco said, is, you know, is this is sort of legitimate? So I got back to him and, and basically said uh, that I, I looked over the, again, it looked like a marketing blast kind of thing, um, and basically said, in short, protein's not a preferred fuel source like carbs and fats, right? Your body rather not burn protein for a fuel. You can burn 5 or 10% of your calories, you know, in, in a workout typically, at, you know, by deaminating, right, getting the nitrogen off of the amino acids and then burning them for a fuel. Um, but protein does have four calories per gram. Now, this is where this gets sticky because 
I sort of do look at protein. Uh, not I, I, free food is going too far, but right. But overeating calories from protein is almost certainly not going to make someone fat, right? The bottom line is, regardless of the mechanisms that you think about, uh, you know how it's it's satiating, and then so you don't eat as much for several hours, or how its thermic effect of food might be twenty to twenty five percent. You know that you would just take off the top of the protein meal just to process it. All that stuff matters, but ultimately, ask yourself: How many people do you know who got obese eating egg whites and skinless chicken breasts? Right. That answer is always going to be zero. You aren't going to meet someone who got fat from overeating protein. And when I say that, I mean protein, the nutrient, right? Not protein foods. I've worked with a lot of dietitians who they'll say high protein diets and in their mind you can tell they're thinking big mac diets right mm -hmm. um bacon and eggs and big macs and and that's where i i'm always quick to point out well those those are often processed foods or protein fat combinations or protein carbon fat combinations they might be protein rich but you're no longer talking about the nutrient protein you're talking about protein containing foods that I think almost no one would diet on, right? You can't be on a high protein diet that's like I said, your plate you got two pieces of skinless boneless chicken on your plate and the rest of it's broccoli or green beans, right? So, we've actually presented data on that before. Like does a high protein diet affect diet quality? Does it reduce fiber? Like in some of the undergrad textbooks I use, it'll say high protein diets are low fiber diets. Uh, they're they're low in phytochemicals, and I would I was I would always make sure the students understand poorly planned high protein diets. Right, we do have a fairly high protein intake in this country from fast foods and low quality greasy meats. Kind of you, you know you get at the drive through, but it doesn't have to be that way. And I think strength sports are a classic example of that. Right, a lot of us will eat a protein rich diet that has plenty of uh, fruits and vegetables in it. So that's where a lot of the confusion takes place, right, is what's protein as a nutrient and what's a protein food. I do more or less consider stuff like ch chicken breast and whatnot. Um, again, I don't like the word free foods. It makes it sound like there's no calories in them, but the calories from protein are very unlikely to be laid down as body fat, right? So the uh, 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 simplest diet I can think of would be count grams of protein, from clean sources, and I know that's a loaded word, but, you know, ch again, ch uh, chicken breasts, lean beef, eggs, egg whites, stuff like that. Eat your weight in pounds and protein, like a gram per pound, and you're probably going to have a fast enough metabolism, enough satiety and things like that, that it's really going to help with weight management. So protein should be a central part of any kind of fat loss diet, uh, both clinically, like a protein-sparing modified fast, or even commercial diets. Protein is often the focus, and I think it should be, right, for all those reasons. It speeds your metabolism. Um, again, with the high thermic effect, it's got uh, a satiety value like nothing else. Um, anyway, but Mike, what are your thoughts about that? Like literally removing protein calories and just doing your daily calorie intake after you subtract off the, you know, 800 calories or whatever from the protein. Yeah, it's I I generally agree with you. I mean, I think it gets confusing because is there calories in protein? Yes, of course. Um, like you said, do those calories can they end up becoming body fat? Which is usually the question when somebody asks what they want to know, right? They usually want to know, hey, how much protein do I need for recovery? And if I eat too much of this, is it going to turn into body fat? And in the past, I said the same thing you did. It's very unlikely because of satiety and all the other factors that go into it. Um, I talked to Stu Phillips about this a while ago, and he basically agreed that it's virtually impossible to turn uh, calories from protein into fat. And I would agree with that also. And then up until probably a couple of years ago, we didn't have any real direct uh, evidence on it. Um, and then, as you know, Dr. Jose Antonio did a study yep. where they just massively overfed these guys protein, like well in excess of 300 grams of protein per day. I can't remember the exact amounts off the top of my head. And they had guys who wanted to get in the study because they got protein as a supplement. 
So they're giving them as a supplement to get over that amount. And he said they had guys complaining that they're eating way too much protein. Mm -hmm. And even when they ran all the data at the end, with just astronomical levels of protein, I think it was well over 300 grams per day for months at a time, they didn't gain virtually any body fat at all. I think it was like no gain whatsoever. Yeah. Um, so I would say you could maybe even go as far now to say that it's, I wouldn't say impossible, but very extremely unlikely that you're going to overeat on protein. Even when we try to sort of clamp calories, we try to really push that number <laughs> up super high. Um, so I, and like you said, I never see anyone who's like, oh, I just ate lean proteins and I got fat. No, <laughs> it doesn't match with yeah. the, the I, real world experience either. What do you know about this, uh, about Brad? I don't really know anything about him. Is he an academic or is he a coach or both or what's his background, you know? Um, I haven't talked to him for several years, but I talked to him in the past initially. He was the guy who initially came out with the book, uh, Eat, Stop, Eat, maybe nine or ten years ago now that uh, kind of caused me to look at uh, fasting. And I initially at the time, I'm like, oh, fasting's horrible. And then after reading his book and doing a bunch more research myself, I'm like, well, maybe it's not too bad and there's some benefits to it. Um, he had a book on protein also that came out that was pretty good. Um, I, I don't remember if he got an undergrad or master's in uh, exercise phys area up in, in Canada there and worked for a supplement company for a while, got kind of fed up with the industry and then kind of left to do his own thing. But not really sure what he's up to now. I haven't talked to him for okay. man, probably three, four years. Some of this, I just, it, it grates me a little bit in the way I'm reading it, right? This is just subjective. I, again, I don't think it's wrong. And I told Francis. Sounds like an ad I, copy also. It, well, yeah, exactly. I mean, it says, yeah. remember, straight protein calories do not count for the total. See, I, I, I would never say it that way. You know, it's, yeah. it, it leaves people thinking that protein has no calories, and, and that's, that's not accurate. But it does beg the question. The interesting question to me is, is a calorie is a calorie is a calorie? And really, I think the answer is no. You know, I know there are the people that do the Twinkie diets, and they do all this. They try to prove the point. But for any type of health or longevity or even weight management and body fatness, right, I've got to think that somebody who eats chicken breast as their calorie source, again, four calories and a gram of protein, you know, every three hours throughout the day, and they, they jack up, you know, they get up to like, let's say, 1,500 calories a day, those people aren't going to have the same body composition, I would argue, as someone whose all of their calories come at 1 a.m. from pizza and beer. You know, yeah. I just don't see that happening. I think there are nuances to calorie sources, and that's kind of what this is about. But no, Francisco, protein is not a free, completely free food. I would not say leave it out of your daily uh, calorie calculations uh, because just for decades, that's not really how clinicians look at that. We include, like if I say college-age men need 3,000 calories a day, that's going to include between one and – 200 grams of protein, right? So between 400 and 800 calories of protein. Um, so I don't think it's a free food, but yeah, for all practical reasons, high fiber, high protein diet, that's how people lose fat, you know, in a lot of ways. It certainly helps. Yeah. Um, and we know from the book you helped edit and write on the dietary, uh, dietary protein resistance exercise for CRC Press that Phil was the cover model for. Oh, right. <laughs> that one of the, the studies in there that we looked at uh, was 0.7 grams per pound of body weight, and they compared it to a low protein group, which was 0.35 grams per pound of body weight. Again, these were not people exercising. And then they slashed their calories by over 50% on Monday, and the group on the higher protein, so the 0.7 group, didn't lose any lean mass. Uh, the group on the 0.35 grams per pound of body weight did lose lean mass. Yep. And again, that, that study wasn't necessarily looking at people who are strength training hardcore per se. Um, but we do have studies that are chronic studies that do show that having more protein does help hold on to lean body mass. I One more thing before I, I ask Phil about how he deals with this, and I, I think we could probably guess in some level, but... I actually have data that I've been meeting to present. It's just a matter of putting the poster together. But uh, some of the data that went into that CRC Press protein book, um, we looked at high self-report. So it's sort of a quasi-experimental design. We did not 
directly feed these individuals, right? But we did it with diet records. So the diet records confirmed that if they were protein seekers, and so we've got a lot of lift, bunch of lifters, they ate over 250 grams of protein a day on average. So that's a whopping amount of protein, 250 grams a day. That's a thousand calories worth of protein. And we did um, DEXA scans on them and they had a higher lean mass index. So a lot of our listeners might be familiar with body mass index, right? Weight for height. Well, this is essentially lean weight for height. They did, and again, it's just an association. It's not causal, but the higher protein intake guys, the protein seekers, uh, had higher lean mass index and they had no difference in body fat, right? So they were eating copious amounts of protein and I honestly wondered if they might even be leaner. They weren't leaner, but they certainly weren't any fatter. Uh, so th that sort of suggests some of this too. And like you said, then Joey Antonio's recent work, it was more directly experimental and with even yeah. higher doses, right? So, um, yeah. So uh, there's... I. Whether it's self-report, it's direct intervention, whatever it is, highly unlikely. But I, again, I, I wouldn't call it a free food because most calorie calculations that you look at, if you want to compare it to any other kind of diet or other things, nobody's pretending that protein has no calories. Um, it's, it's, it's not thermodynamically, you know, sort of um, bioenergetically accurate to say that. And I, I, anyway, so Phil, um, high protein diets, I'm... I'm guessing you don't worry how much protein people eat. I just want them to eat it. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Um, yeah. You know, generally, it's just, okay, you probably need to eat some more. Like we had one girl here recently that was getting like 500 grams of carbohydrates and 50 grams of protein. It's oh. Like, oh. Yeah. Well, we need to – let's swap some of that. So <laughs> – and things like that. You know, we just look – let's get some in and then – uh you know, I'm lucky right now. I'd say 85% of the people I'm working with are athletes. And with most of them, I just got to get them to eat more. And like I had two younger guys come in and it's like, okay, you need to eat like an asshole for a little while. You're, you're, <laughs> you're 19. Let's eat. Let's eat whatever's in front of your face and train hard. Yep. Yeah. And, uh, and lo and behold, they're making gains like crazy. Mm -hmm. so, and they're like, you're magic. Like, no, <laughs> <laughs> I just got you eating and training. So, right. yeah. Um, the stimulus, right, is the key. Yeah. It, the training ah. stimulus. If anybody went on a, a quote unquote seafood diet, they'd get <laughs> obese. But when you're constantly yeah. stimulating muscle growth, yeah, yeah, you partition it. You you're know. 19 to 25, you know, doesn't hurt. <laughs> oh, yeah. I can't get away with what I could then now. But, uh, yeah. yeah, and I think that's where people that really lift and are really in the trenches, sometimes they're going to differ from the, the usual, you know, health professional. You know, like you, you talk to a nurse or a dietitian maybe or a public health kind of person who they don't lift, and they might actually be resistant to the idea of shoveling in, you know, listen, relax. For the next 12 or 16 weeks, we're going to let this 19-year-old young man eat some saturated fat for God's sake. Yeah. You yeah. know, um, yeah. as opposed to fretting about it. It's like, you know, do you yeah. really think you're going to ruin, you're going to give this, this kid um, uh, an MI <laughs> even 20, 30 years down the road because for the next three or four months, he's just going to eat as much of everything as he can. You know, yeah. it's like that's your, 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 you're going to actually ruin the immediate effect that you're going for, you know. Yeah. So. Yeah. And your body's just not that fragile. No. Okay. So. Um, next one here. This is from Facebook, and this is delayed, so I apologize. It's um, EMS Gator Girl. She said, uh, hello, longtime listener of Iron Radio. I power lift, and I suffer from bad allergies. Uh, I've had surgery for deviated septum, uh, widened nasal sinus openings, removal of bone spurs, shaved uh, turbinates. Uh, several things here. Still get infections frequently. I came across a supplement and wondered if you had any comments about it. Uh, I listened to your show and have never heard of this in particular. Mount Angel Vitamins, uh, Cursetin Nettle Plus, natural supplement for sinus and nasal health. Um, I guess it's supposed to support healthy histamine levels, uh, etc. Uh that's not the approach I would probably go, but again, you're talking about a specific sort of medical condition. I'm not well read on how to deal with, 
you know, histamine and that sort of thing. Uh, listeners, you can probably hear that I these mornings, this time of year, I sound like I'm I'm talking with my fingers on my nose. So I have sort of chronic sinusitis myself. But um, uh, quercetin is an interesting chemical. That's one of the compounds in grapefruit that might slow drug metabolism, like other drugs, <laughs> right? Um, and yeah, you'll see some, a, a variety of phytochemicals that have anti-inflammatory effects. But as far as clinical uh, benefit, like, oh, I can breathe again, you know, and maybe. Uh, I don't think I would put my money there. When it comes to frequent infections, I think uh, this is going to sound very generic, but eat a wide variety of foods, including lots of fruits and vegetables with vitamin C. Maybe take a low-dose 250-milligram vitamin C. Um, if That's not going to keep you you know, from getting a cold necessarily, but it can reduce the severity or the duration of a upper respiratory tract infection, potentially. Um, it, it's just tough. I don't know. I don't think I'll, I would take a lot of the supplements out there um, that you would spray up your nose. I, I think I might, you know, just look into a short co course of Flonase or something if that works. Or uh, if it's not an airflow issue and it's just about the infections, uh, I would just go talk to my doctor about that. You know, I have recurring infections and, and not expect them to know that much about nettle or, uh, or quercetin or some of these you know, um, herbal preps. Uh, Mike, what do you think? Um, yeah, I mean, my thought would be, I would be wondering about gut health and just her overall just immune system in general. It sounds like she's had a fair amount of uh, sinus procedures. Uh, my sister was very much the same way. She's had a lot of sinus procedures. She would get sick a couple times a year. It's a very stressful job. And then about two years ago, we just redid a bunch of stuff on her uh, gut health, got that working better. And at one point it got so bad that she started getting eye infections on top of it, went to the optometrist, the optometrist couldn't figure out what was going on, tried a bunch of stuff. I even tried, you know, basically local steroid drops, everything else would clear up and then come back. And uh, luckily since we've done, kind of reworked a bunch of her gut health, removed a few things that were bothering her. Uh, she's only had one time where she got pretty sick over the past two years where she was getting sick, you know, four or five times a year, pretty, pretty often. So I'll probably look at that. Um, we had Dr. Michael Ruscio on here before with some gut stuff. So if she wants to go back and listen to that episode and then possibly you could look at like a, a xylitol uh, nasal spray. There's some eh, okay data that that might help. And it's much as I hate the word natural, um, yeah, just yeah. kind of a natural over-the-counter uh, source also. Um, oh, you yeah, know, that'd be my thoughts. If I could yeah, correct myself here, I don't think she's having any problems with airflow, and I was talking about nasal sprays and stuff, but I, I, these are tablets that she's referring to. Yeah, uh, I, don't, okay. I don't see uh, any kind of tablet having any acute effect on you know, re reducing the number of infections you get. Usually, to me, it's exposure, partly, Right, like I, sure. when I used to work in a gym and clean the bathrooms, I had head colds all the freaking time. You know, it feels like no matter what I did, you know, wiping down the benches, there's sweat, and there's you know, obviously everything that goes <laughs> goes on in the bathroom, and you know that kind of stuff. And there's just droplets, and you're trying to stay clean. Um, it's just it's just tough. And the other thing might be actually, if she's a power lifter, remember that overtraining. If you're overdoing it, sure. you know, you could suppress your immune function. Moderate amounts of exercise is an, is immune boosting, but exhaustive exercise, or if you're overtraining, would actually lower. Like there's some interesting studies with lower IgA, right? Um, immunoglobulin A. It's an antibody in your nasal passages, and it's sort of a first line of defense against uh, infections. That can go down. With overtraining, you know, some studies suggest that glutamine, uh, the amino acid, might be able to provide some fuel for your uh, immune system, for the white blood cells, your leukocytes, and maybe that's got an indirect benefit, although that's very controversial, like glutamine for overtraining and upper respiratory tract infections. Um, so maybe it's too much training, too. Um, but yeah, the supplement route for multiple. Um, you know, struggles with infections. I, I, you, you just have to look at both sides of this. You know, what what's exposure versus what's suppressed immunity. Uh, Mike, to your point, yeah, very cool connections between uh, what you eat and 
gut flora and immunity. So that could be something that you might want to address. Depends if you have a again a, a varied diet and that kind of thing, or um, more of a medical issue. So you know we're not physicians. So that's one quick thing on the exposure side is probably trying to make sure you're breathing through your nose more than your mouth because your nose has a filter. <laughs> I know that sounds kind of maybe overly simplistic, but I don't know. I just see a lot of people that can't use their nose to breathe hardly at all. And maybe she's just because of the issues she's had, maybe she switched to more mouth breathing over time. So yeah, might be something to look at. I haven't yeah. seen a whole lot of data either way on that one yet. Yeah. All right, we have one last one before we go to break, and then we talk about heroes and lessons. This is just, I'm going to just paraphrase here. This is from Dean. He says, uh, hi, guys. Dean here, the maker of, uh, he's got a, a particular coffee mug invention. Uh, he says, my son, Nick, totally into physiology and nutrition, listens to your podcast and told me that you guys love coffee. Um I wrestled this special mug all the way from idea to market, and that's what caught my eye, right? Because I've recently done that myself. Um, in fact, the lawyers just filed the patent. So I, I now am a, a provisional patent holder on something very specific uh, that has to do with brewing coffee and making it you know, um, have different mental and physical benefits on people. But anyway, the point is uh, I, I like the idea that he's this entrepreneur. Uh, I'm just starting to look for a way to let people know about it. So, again, we're not really running ads here, <clears throat> which, by the way, Dean, is why I didn't give the title of it. But the point being is, um, he says, I wonder if if you'd like some mugs to try and if, if you would mention them on the show. So I'll, I'll follow up with you, Dean, uh, about that. Like I said, I'm, I want to be very supportive of innovation and inventions and that kind of stuff without bringing too much commercialism into the podcast, right? We just try to be more of a public radio kind of format, so I'm just wary of that. If you notice, even when I talk about my own invention, that I just got a patent, I'm very excited about it, but I don't want to kind of push it through this, you know. Uh, on some level, maybe, you know. Somebody's like, hey, I, you know, when, Lana, you give me more details, or Dean, uh, more details, then we'll give it a try. Maybe we can almost set up some kind of a, a pilot thing where people can try it and give feedback. But you see what I mean, just trying to be constructive like that. Uh, I'm, yeah, I'm curious, Dean. I, I don't know um, what would be special about a mug like this, but if you've taken it all the way through patent stage and market, there must be something cool going on there. So, interesting. Nice. Okay, we're going to go to break. When we come back, we're going to talk about heroes and some of the lessons that we have learned from them. Hey listeners, this is Dr. Lonnie Lowry. If you've ever had anyone critique you uh, on your protein intake as part of your weightlifting lifestyle, oh you poor meathead, all that extra protein is going to rot your kidneys or weaken your bones or dehydrate you or give you gout or who knows what. Uh, there is a book available. You could simply Google CRC Press and Lowry. And what I've done is reach out to experts all over the world and create a book, a single compendium that you can hold up and say, this is why I consume extra protein. This can be very valuable when you're um, being quote unquote educated uh, by various professionals on the topic. Uh, there's enormous amount of literature in this book on the safety, uh, the effectiveness, how protein works in cells, the history of protein and weight trainers, uh, much more. So again, please check out CRC Press and Protein and Lowry. You can just Google that, and uh, I do, full disclosure, I do make a small single-digit uh, royalty on the book, but that's not why I did it. I did it so we can all have something, uh, our particular population, uh, to both defend what we do and to inform our nutrition and our eating. Thanks. Iron Radio is, of course, primarily a podcast. But over the years, there have been technical glitches calling for backup streaming and listeners who wanted the convenience of other sources of audio content. Toward this end, Iron Radio is now simulcast and backed up on YouTube. If needed, please search Lawnman07 
or Iron Radio from within YouTube. There's not much video, but if you like to listen through YouTube on a Roku or other living room device, there you go. Like your weekly fix of Iron Radio? In addition to being a popular institute on iTunes, we are also on email. Simply go to www.ironradio.org and sign up for the voluntary email. You'll get a once per week email, no more, that's little more than the show notes and a link to the audio. So go for it. All right, everyone, we're back. It's Phil and Lonnie and Mike, and we're going to sort of have some gym talk, something fun, not necessarily instructional, although, you know, there's always lessons to learn from other people's experiences, uh, about our heroes, right? So many listeners, if you think about your own training or nutrition philosophy, and if you don't, maybe you should, like what's your general outlook on this? Um, often our our philosophies are amalgams, right? They're sort of a hodgepodge of lessons that we've learned from favorite heroes. So that's what we're going to do. We're going to go through one at a time, and I'm just going to ask you guys, uh, Phil, let's start with you. Uh, so if you can name a, a hero, mentor, someone who's arguably famous in some way would be helpful, but so other people can kind of get an idea about who you're referring to, but a hero and a lesson or a quality that you retained from them. Oh, I don't know if he's famous. He should be, but <laughs> um, one of the people I always go back to is Calvin Neff, who I trained with in in Thailand, Thailand. when I was there for almost a year. Yeah, and uh, they should know him because he like he ranked elite in like seven body weight classes. This is back mm. when when uh, um, Louis Simmons was big in lifting, so when he was being competitive and things like that. So that was one of his big competitors. But anyways. The, the thing that struck home with him was my learning because this is way early on when everybody when you're early on you seem to do a little bit of everything uh just the, the basics work just it, literally if you want to get stronger just squat more if you want to deadlift just deadlift more if that's your goal whatever you want to get good at probably practice it a lot more instead of all the other stuff you know oh, i'm gonna do some squats and then good mornings and then this and this and this these 17 different accessories why don't we just squat <laughs> you know <laughs> If you really just pay pay attention to the meat on the plate and then not so much attention to the accessories. And I think a lot of people uh, flip-flop that a little too much. You know, Phil, I think if if consumers in our industry stuck to that, like, well, maybe lift heavier or lift a little more, yeah. lift a little less. Yeah. You know, the real yeah. <laughs> basic stimulus stuff. Yeah. We wouldn't run into, like, the supplement industry would almost fall apart, right? Yeah. Because they bank on you, you over-focusing on a particular mechanism. Yes. Or we'll, we'll look at a study, something in a dish, you know, a test tube, something yeah. in a very reduced environment. Like that question just now about the infections and stuff. Yeah, you could probably find some good uh, indirect rationale why you might want to take some of these uh, phytochemicals uh, for inflammation, and therefore that might help your nose, you know, or infections or, or whatever. Um, but you get bogged down in the minutia. It, right, and I think a lot of marketers bank on that, and the the Phil Stevens message isn't as profitable for those guys. <laughs> no, not at all. Yeah. Uh, so yeah, uh, all right, Mike. What about you? A hero and a lesson or quality that you retained? Yeah, I would say on the lifting side, probably the person I go with is uh, Bill Starr, who is most famous for kind of the five by five approach and. He had a bunch of other stuff, too. And the first time I saw this was, you know, oh, man, going back decades ago now. And at the time, like, pretty much every lifter, although it's probably not as much that way now, I almost want to say this is borderline pre-internet or the internet was just starting. For whatever reason, like, the 3 by 10 method just seemed to be what everyone did. And yeah. for the longest time, I just kind of thought that was all there was. <laughs> there was. Mm -hmm. And I remember seeing Bill Starr stuff, and he's talking about a five by five. I'm like, five by five? What the hell? This guy's a nut job. What is he talking about? Yeah. You know, and then he kind of would go through and explain it and, you know, his specific system that he used primarily for football. And it just got me thinking that, oh, 
there's not really a magical set and rep scheme. It depends on, you know, what are you trying to do? What are you trying to achieve? And you can play around with all sorts of different parameters. Um, so that's kind of the, the first time I actually saw saw that actually written out. One that was like right after that was uh, Pollock Principles, where he just kind of laid out different, you know, instead of three by 10, do 10 by three and, you know, five by five and just different loading schemes. And my head was just like, oh my gosh, there's there's so much more to this. <laughs> yeah, I, I'm sort of snickering behind the scenes here because God, Mike, that is so you. Like, you know, you're so yeah. <laughs> like, you, you love to tinker, you know, oh, yeah. whether it's weird movements, uh, no offense, but, you know, purposely oh, yeah, odd no, totally. lifts, right, for a reason, yeah, or the, the schemes, extremes on both ends. You're always looking at the world like an engineer and a scientist, and you, I can see yeah. you just running with that stuff because you're right. I started the same way when I was 12 years old in the early 80s. Yeah. Three sets of 10. That's just that's just what you did. I there was yeah. it really wasn't up for discussion. You know, I mean innovation really wasn't a thing. You just did three sets of curls, 10 reps each. You did three sets of benching, 10 sets e or 10 reps each, you know, stuff like yeah, that. Your big innovation was which day you did 3 by 10. You know, was yeah. it, you know, this day or that day? <laughs> right. Yeah, there's so much to programming. Yeah, exactly. Uh, opens up whole vistas there. I'm going to just offer an athlete. Uh, I, I just wrote down three bodybuilders, really. I'm just keeping it light. I'm not going to go super academic. I mean, obviously, I, I had um, people I worked under directly, sort of like Phil just mentioned, you know. But, like, when I worked under Pete Lemon, he was world-renowned. I mean, he took me all over the world oh, yeah. talking about protein and stuff. And even his mentors, you know, Duncan McDougall and those guys in Canada and Mark Tarnopolsky and, you know, all those sorts of guys, or even guys like uh, Pavel Komi, um, Hakkinen, you know, the Eastern Bloc lifting guys. But I'm going to try, try to stick to the athletes, really. But um, I wrote three guys down here. I like them for different reasons. One might surprise people, but I don't know if you guys remember Al Beckles. Al, Albert Beckles oh, old was, school, right? yeah, yeah, oh, man, 80s lifter. And I really admired this guy. He was kicking young guys' ass when I first saw him in the magazine. He was like 56 years old or something like that. Um, you, know, you know, he was a pro bodybuilder, right? So these guys, let's be frank, they're not natural. So you go, well, he looks like that. Because, well, fine. I don't care what you're, about that right now. But, you know, on a playing field with a bunch of young guys. But he had a classic physique, super, like, peaked biceps. He had a great look. And I just loved, even when I was a young man, and now I, it, it sort of echoes with me even more that I'm getting older, but I really respected the, the, this guy. You know, he seemed like well-spoken, sort of a, a mentor among, among the pros, and he was, he was just an old guy just kicking ass. Mm -hmm. And it just the nobility of it really struck me even yeah. then. Like, this guy is awesome. So, uh, all right, Phil, second hero, and maybe a lesson from him or uh. her. The lesson, I'll, I'll blame it on Jim Wendler right now just because he talks about it a lot. <laughs> but it's that discipline is more important than motivation. Uh, uh, we've been talking about it a lot lately. Uh, the motivation is overplayed. Like it, I was talking to my athletes at the gym the other day. And when I went in at 530, I was like, you know, I was very motivated to buy a freaking uh, uh, like a cupcake on the way to the gym. But I didn't. I'm disciplined enough that I grabbed like a water and a beef jerky. You know, there's lots of days where I'm not motivated to go to the gym, but I'm disciplined enough to, okay, got to get my stuff done. You know, motivation is short lived and it's people that stick around and do great. Uh, it's not about motivation. It's about their discipline enough to do it. So, yeah, uh, that kind of draws in. I remember when I was a, a teenager, I had an old martial arts instructor and he told us about intrinsic versus extrinsic motivation, you know, mm -hmm. and, how he used to say intrinsic motivation is really the key to success, you know, because if you're extrinsically motivated, things come and go and you're a victim of your environment. And, and let's face it, we all use extrinsic motivation for things to music and stuff like yeah. that. But um, that's an interesting way to look at it, though. Instead of intrinsic, extrinsic motivation, instead make the opposites discipline and motivation. Yeah, yeah that's, that's a neat way to look at it. Yeah, I like that. And the first thought my brain goes to under discipline is what are your systems so that you stay disciplined? Mm -hmm. You know, in your case, you probably had water and beef jerky already there or you knew where to get them. Yeah. Right. You know, and that's yep. those types of things are long term sustainable. Trying to rely on yourself to be 
motivated to turn down the chocolate cake today, uh, it's only going to last so long. <laughs> right. Yep. Motivation eventually turns into discipline. You know, you yes. get motivated, oh, exactly. you start doing something, and then you see results, and, oh, okay, well, this works. I'm going to stick with it. You know, even though I want that cake, I'm not doing it right now. Yeah. You know? Yeah. It's it's the maturity for delayed gratification, right, yes. in a lot of ways. Uh, that same mentor of mine actually used to say, discipline is doing something when it's not convenient, you yeah. know. And when you say it like that, it almost makes you feel embarrassed that you don't have more discipline. <laughs> you know, <laughs> oh, it's not convenient. I don't think I'll do legs today, you know. But people do that. Um. All right, Mike, what about a second person from you, an athlete or a hero in a lesson? Yeah, I would say, you know, probably some of the super early lifters. You know, everyone kind of picks Sandow for obvious, you know, reasons. Um, the guy I picked is uh, Thomas Inch, who people are probably not super familiar with. Um, but he was a performing strongman, you know, back almost 100 years ago, around that time frame. And he was famous for having the Thomas Inch dumbbell, which he mm -hmm. called the unliftable dumbbell. And it's a dumbbell that's a solid and cast, about 172 pounds. And the handle is a little bit bigger than the diameter of like a Coke can or a soda can. And you'll see this dumbbell once in a while, like at um, it's like the Arnold Festival. There'll be someone will usually have one there, like Brett from Sornex a lot of times will have one there. And I, th I think Brett from Sornex did this a few times where he put a $100 bill underneath the dumbbell. And said anyone who can just pick it up and deadlift it, who is obviously not a competitor there, that he'd give them the $100 bill. And the rumor was no one really did it. And it's just interesting because it's you look at it and you're like, I should be able to lift that. I mean, mm -hmm. to deadlift a, a dumbbell that's 170 pounds is, you know, very achievable for most people. When you make the handle that much bigger and you make it cast, the thing wants to rotate on you. So it's very hard. And what I the lesson I got from it is that you can just kind of do whatever you want to do with your own goals. And hell, you could even invent a crazy ass dumbbell and <laughs> have it made. And, you know, that can be kind of, you know, your own little shtick type thing. Um, and of course, Inch was very much a performer. You know, there's some videos that it looks like he clearly was probably switching dumbbells and doing some other foolery and things of that nature. Um, but even now, it's still considered a, a very difficult, you know, feat to, to do. Yeah. Um, so yeah, that's what I learned from it. Cool. If I stick with my theme about, um, pro bodybuilders, actually Tom Platts had a big influence on me when I was younger too. And I think the lesson really is he would talk about the philosophy of it. You know, he, he used, uh, lifting almost with the, with the mind and the muscle and the feeling daily feelings of handles and, and repetitions and all the things that he used to talk about or expanding his awareness, you know, he was on a, a little deeper level uh, with the lifting, you know, it, it, it was almost a pursuit of mindfulness, you know, and, and that kind of thing. Uh, so lifting, it was more than just dumbly hoisting up a, a chunk of iron, and, you know, and setting it down. I mean, ultimately, that's what we're all doing. But he was using it as a vehicle for something a little deeper, right? And I thought that was really cool. He, he was always so also... Um, magnanimous and stuff when he would talk about and humble you know he would talk about like arnold is bodybuilding you know to me you know and he would always talk up other people and um but that really struck home big time with me i remember watching the comeback which was a lot about arnold of course but but tom platt's played a real role in that it's it's free on youtube as total rebuild i think with different soundtracks and weirdness but um yeah tom platt's and his, and the the philosophical bent uh to the way he used bodybuilding and self-actualization and all that, that hit, hit home with me a lot. Um, yeah. And then a quick comment on that, too, is the first time I saw him speak, it was like, whoa, you don't really expect that from him because it's so, you know, stereotyped, you know, dumb meathead and all this kind of stuff. And you hear a lot of those guys talk, and they speak very eloquently and put a lot of deep, you know, many hours of thought into it. And I thought that was just extremely refreshing and something yeah. very much for more public consumption, you know, to try to break down some of those stereotypes, too. Right. I think, in fact, all three guys on my list of bodybuilders, they're breaking the mold in some way, you know, yeah. um, either, you know, yeah, not the dumb meathead or the old guy who, you know, showing it's what's possible, you know, all that kind of stuff. Very cool. Mm -hmm. um, Phil, last one. 
uh, maybe a third hero in a lesson that you retained or even yeah. how you employ it, you know? I'm going to put two things together in this. Um, oh, gosh, I'll blame this on numerous people. A bunch of Olympic <laughs> lifting coaches I worked with, maybe Jesse Burdick, but how the importance of perfect form in training. Like, training is the place, in my opinion, where we're not loaded and as important as form. You know, in, in my gym, in, in training, our goal is to hit perfect lifts. Um, now, if we can do that heavy, great. You know, <laughs> that's amazing. But, uh, you know, it's the place where we practice perfection. And what's the quote? You know, don't do it until you get it right. Do it until you can't get it wrong. Um, mm-hmm. And then on the other end, uh, side of that is then learning, and it's, it's a large part missed in this country in strength sports, is there is no award for form. <laughs> you know, at some point, <laughs> at some point, powerlifting, weightlifting is about how much you pick up, you know, and that the place for that is on the platform. We're trying to go with that perfect form that we've learned on the plat- uh, in, in training, but sometimes shit goes wrong, and it's just about, okay, get it up. <laughs> you know, yeah. If you watch Taranko, you know, clean and jerk 586 or whatever it was, it wasn't pretty, but it was no. within the confines of the rules, yeah. you know, and that's what won it. There, there is no, you know, he didn't get beat by the guy who had the pretty clean and jerk that was 100 pounds lighter. So You know, Phil, <laughs> from, a, from a spectator perspective, uh, it's it's more exciting to watch a, a larger barbell fly overhead than it is like oh, you'd have to be really quite advanced in you know to be oh, a yeah. spectator in the crowd be like look at that perfection he was that that could have been more than a half a centimeter off you know what I mean yeah uh, you'd oh, have to yeah. be a real technician to appreciate if the sport sure. was about form you know that's one of the annoying things about social media is like they literally turn they try to turn strength sports into gymnastics whose toes weren't pointed at. 28.7 degrees. <laughs> I could have squatted 1,000 pounds. Right. You know? yeah. Shut up. So, <laughs> so shut up. <laughs> you know? But, I mean, like I said, in the gym, we are striving for perfect form. You know, we rep upon rep upon rep. You know, it was like with my weightlifters, it's like, okay, we're going to go as high as we can with this rule. You know, it's got to be this way. Um, once it goes south of that, we drop down and we're working on, on perfect lifts. But those per- that perfect lifts at submaximal loads leads to bigger lifts at maximal loads. That's almost a martial arts kind of um, attitude to me. You know, like I had a yep. mentor I'm not going to talk about, but Ron Courtright was his name. He he was a <clears throat> exercise physiologist, martial arts instructor, uh, and I trained under him for years. And that's right. That's the theme. Whether it's uh, I've over my lifetime, in different lives, I've I've trained in taekwondo or in kendo and what do they do repetition repetition perfect form you know the kind of thing like uh it, it, listeners if you're not familiar with the way a lot of this stuff is done think about like in the in the conan movie you know in that strict that that asian instructor's like psh, 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 you know smacks him and says no here you know and you just keep they just keep coming back to the no no here and you do it wrong <laughs> no here yeah. you know and it, it's that repetition that burns in those motor patterns kind of you know, yeah. sort of to your point. Um, all right. Was that was that the end of that one? That's it. Okay. Yep. Miguel, uh, last one. Yeah. I kind of lump a couple, couple people into this, um, uh, like Dr. Sue Kleiner, uh, Dr. John Brardy, and even you, Dr. Lonnie Lowry, for the earliest stuff that I was exposed to on the nutrition side that was not just in a pure research setting. Um, the first book I ever bought with more of the lay bent was Power Reading by Dr. Kleiner. Oh. And it was crazy because it's like, oh, there's people out there who are actually bridging the gap between academics and trying to help more of the, I guess, the masses for a better word. You know, a lot of it was at a pretty high level if you were an advanced athlete, but that was some of the first stuff I was exposed to that was people with very much academic background or were proceeding and doing an academic background, um, but were also trying to disseminate uh, information. And especially, you know, Sue kind of runs her own business. You know, John has obviously been very successful with uh, Science Link and Precision Nutrition, and, you know, you're still out educating people also. And it was also the first time I realized that, oh, this possibly could be a career somehow you know you don't just have to go into the academic only you know research and never see the light of day um so i thought that was super interesting and 
you know, even now it still blows my mind that, you know, I know all those people, obviously on iron radio, I presented with Sue Kleiner again for the second or third year. Um, yeah, it's taken about you know two decades of work. So it wasn't like it just happened overnight. Um, but I thought having those early exposures was, was super helpful in showing that, Hey, you can go down this path and some other people have gone down it before. So it's definitely possible. Yeah. Well, thank you for that. As far as, yeah, cause you're one of the smartest guys I've ever met. Uh, and so, <laughs> <laughs> thank you. <laughs> yeah, uh, but the, the point being is, uh, yeah, so we don't get in mutual admiration society <laughs> is, yeah, that, again, breaking molds, right? Like, because yeah. you almost, there, there's, there, there are these renegades that do that, you know? Like when I was in Phil's gym and he's drawing stick figures on the board and he's talking about lever arms and, you know, resistance arms, mm -hmm. I'm like, you know, maybe that's inevitable that the sports move in that direction. Like knowing more is better than knowing less, but then you kind of yeah. come full circle, or like you said, I mean, there are guys that when they walk away from academia, that ivory tower sort of, um, I don't know what the word I'm looking for is, um, banishes them on some level. You know, oh, yeah. or, or that's the risk. Like uh, I've talked to some people who work in and out of industry or in and out of um, uh, lifting, and they, they return to teaching, and it's actually very challenging to even get back in because, you know, then yeah. the – the know-it-alls who don't have the real-world experience, you know, it's almost like they're protecting their, yeah, you know, their cloistered little safe little world, um, and somehow what you did was was not good, and that's so different, right? Because in business or even in clinical stuff, they're almost expected to go practice, right, as part of their academic appointment, but in science, yeah, I don't know, it's it's stickier business, and and blazing a path that's a hybrid kind of thing is. It, yeah, that's it calls for a whole different level of thinking. I think. I mean, if you want to have the irony in, is impact, people presenting in college are presenting to students who are most likely going to quote unquote go out in the real world. Very few of them are probably going to go on to only be academics. Yeah. Which I always thought that was such a a weird dichotomy that you don't see in a lot of other industries or areas. Yeah. What good is academia if it's like this this forbidden tower of secret wizards? <laughs> Yeah, <laughs> <laughs> that, that don't really have much impact, you know. I mean, yeah. that's one of the things I'm sure will come up in Boston uh, this coming week for me at this entrepreneurship thing is one of the biggest challenges, I think, of teaching innovation and entrepreneurship and all that kind of stuff, and I sort of mix it with the scientific method, but is how do you make it real, right? How do you make it real world? Um, and I think we've, we're missing a lot of times that journeyman apprenticeship kind of thing that we should return to, you know, back in the day, that's how people learned, you know, artists, plumbers, pick one, you know, they, they trained under woodworkers, craftsmen, they trained under someone uh, until they got good. They didn't just read about it and then were turned loose and said, now you're an expert, mm -hmm. you know. Mm -hmm. um, I'm going to be very brief because we're out of time. Uh, my third bodybuilder that I learned something from I, was Frank Zane. I think I'm, I'm jealous mm. that, that Phil's actually got a chance to talk to him. <laughs> um, he's one of the guys, though, I would be tongue tied a little bit like there. It takes an awful <laughs> lot to make me starstruck a little but, And I think because he was he, he sort of showed that you don't have to be a 300 pound behemoth to be a bodybuilder. You know, yeah. oftentimes we're always talking about, listen, there's weight classes in these things, you know, um, but it was a classic air that he had and i don't just mean like his physique with the proportion and you know i mean he was in shape probably in the you know 195 pound ish kind of range um but you know he had choreographed posing routines when like there's one in he's in munich i think you can find it on youtube and he walks out on the stage and everything about it has the decorum of the olympic games you know it's not some cheesy pelvis swiveling male stripper act to you know in the background <laughs> it, and i just i really liked that there was a level of sophistication and intelligence about that guy and uh, yeah so that's what i liked about him too he showed that there's a, an element of refinement and he showed that you know and again the lesson for me is you don't have to be embarrassed if you're not you know 300 pounds in the off season you can be good in muscle sports because you're you might have certain gifts in a, in a different way you know, and he was just such a, a respectable, classical kind of dude. 
All right. Um, we are out of time, so um, that's it. Thanks, everybody, for yeah. the yeah for the info. Yeah, thank you. <clears throat> Until next week. See ya. Hey, listeners, have you seen the store at ironradio.org? There are three halls in the store, one for Phil, one for Fortress, and one for myself, Dr. Lowry, and they're thematic. So you can go into our Halls of Iron store and choose based on your goal. If you need something to learn or read or something nutritional, you can look in my store, uh, Lonnie's store. If you want something about injury prevention uh, or competition, then take a look at Phil's Hall of Iron. And if you want something about motivation or daily training, Fortress's Hall has what you're looking for. There are some fun heroic descriptors uh, as you browse through the stores. We try to make it a little more fun than the average boring online store. And whether you're a novice lifter or someone more experienced, you can take heart that you're not wasting your time. The things that we put in each hall of iron are actually based on our own recommendations. Protein powders that we know to be good, uh, knee sleeves, wraps of some kind, things that Fortress uses in his own training. Uh, the stuff you, you see, you know is good. This way you don't waste time. So check out the Iron Radio store at ironradio.org and um, let us know what you think on the forums and certainly you can request products and we will uh, screen them before they go in. So thanks for listening. Iron Radio is accepting donations. If you like what we do, the professors, the scientists, the bodybuilding show promoters, the athletes themselves in powerlifting and bodybuilding, um, please consider making a donation or maybe buying something from the ironradio.org uh, store. Uh, we also are accepting supporting members. So for $4 a month, which is frankly less than the bank sneaks out of your account in fees, you can step up and support a form of sort of public radio for the bodybuilding and powerlifting and strength community. The Iron Radio Podcast and all of the audio on ironradio.org is for informational purposes only. If you're interested in starting a diet or exercise program, it's important to check with your physician. Also seek the help of registered dietitians, athletic trainers, and qualified exercise physiologists in order to make the progress that you need.